Good morning. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. It is always a joy to worship with you and to um, be a family together. If this is your first Sunday with us, I say to you, welcome home. Um, we are glad that you are here. And if you are a, a first time visitor, make sure you stop on the way out and one of our hosts or hostesses will have a goodie bag for you. Uh, we invite you to pick it up and learn a little bit about us as we would like to learn about you. As we know, here at Westminster, our mission is that and our prayer is for all to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that as we know Jesus Christ, we continue to grow in our faith. It's not a once and done kind of thing. And as we grow in our faith, our heart grows also in a desire to share that good news with others, to be concerned about the world who does not yet know Jesus. As we share the world with others and go out into the world, then they come to know Jesus and grow in their faith and go and tell others and that's friends how the kingdom grows right that's how the kingdom expands and god has given us that privilege to be ambassadors for jesus christ i hope um, if you haven't done so already please fill out the connection card that's in your bulletin share if you're a first-time visitor just share as much information as you're comfortable sharing uh, but if there is, are any changes in your contact information, please let us know. We really appreciate that um, when we are kept up to date in the church office. Also share any joys or concerns that you may have. It is a privilege for us as your pastors, for the midweek prayer team, to pray through these each and every week. Put those in the offering bag when they come around. And uh, Oh, and if you are a first-time visitor, just share as much information as you're comfortable sharing. We are in the season of Lent. That's why we have the lovely purple stoles and the purple vestments as well. Uh, we have continue to have our Wednesday night soup supper, a sup simple meal of soup and bread at 5.30 where we gather as a church family. 6.15, we have our small groups and our Lenten series. I invite you all to come to that. Um, in fact, the soup this week I'm, being, I'm hearing is being made by Barnabas. Tomato bisque. He's good in the kitchen, friends. So uh, I invite you to come for that on, on Wednesday night. Also today, immediately after this service, we have our annual congregational meeting. We invite you to stay for that. If you are a member, you're, you will be able to vote for our elders and deacons. If you're not a member, just come and be part of the life of the church. And uh, uh, be able to, we will be receiving the 2017 financial, final, end of the year financial statement, and also the 2018 budget as well. So please invite you to stay for that meeting that will be here immediately after the service. And um, the difference a week can make. My friends, um, many of us are still a bit in shock and numb uh, with the news that Michael Wing, our choir director, died on Tuesday. He, uh, his wife came home from work and he was found um, at home and had stopped breathing. He had had some health issues, had been in the hospital for surgery, um, had been back in again, but was doing well. And so, um, we are at a loss. We are certainly at a loss. Not only those in the church family here that grieve his death, um, for those in the St. Mary's community where he taught music for so many years, and also in the arts, uh, music community in the Rogue Valley. Um, his presence will be missed. And friends, God is in control. This is our Father's world. And we can trust that um, although we, while we miss Michael's presence, friends, he is having a good time. Amen. He is praising our God right now, singing in that beautiful choir, and is no longer in pain, is, um, wow, well, he is doing well. So friends, we are grateful for that also and for the hope that we have that God will use this, even this, yes, this, 
to further God's kingdom. We trust that. So keep Kathy, his wife, his sons, and their children um, uh, in your prayers in the coming days and weeks. And we will share more information as it comes available regarding a service in the future. So friends, would you pray with me? <clears throat> God, you are our God. And so we come here to this place today to be with family. We come here today to hear your word for us. To give you praise, to worship you. So God, open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts to the message you have for us, for each and every one of us on this day. We pray this in Jesus' name, and let all God's people say, God through our call to worship I invite you to stand as you are able and share in the words of Psalm 46 as printed in your order of worship God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea though the waters roar and foam be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us join together in worshiping God through song, hymn number 547, The Church is One Foundation. We will sing all the verses.
This is a time of Lent, which is a, uh, a season of self-reflection, and as we look within ourselves, we recognize, we have to recognize that we fall woefully short of what the Lord has called us to and who he has called us to be. Let us join together in our prayer of confession, again found printed in your bulletin, and as we confess, open ourselves to the healing power of God that does come in and transform who we are. Let us pray. Loving Father, you invite us to step out in faith, to place ourselves in your hands, and commit to a wholehearted life with you, where we can find joy in your presence. And yet we confess that this is difficult for us to do. We are easily distracted from your presence by both our pains and our desires. In our insecurity, we find it difficult to trust you. Forgive us, Lord. Cover over our doubts and fears and selfishness with the grace of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, renew our hearts and increase our faith that we might join you where you are and follow you where you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear once again the good news of the gospel. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. Friends, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and made new. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
As we prepare our hearts for our time of congregational prayer, I invite you to turn to hymn number 495, It Is Well With My Soul. Horatio Spafford, who wrote the words to this hymn, experienced great personal tragedy in his own life. And yet, despite that tragedy, or perhaps even because of it, he is able to write these words and take note especially of verses 2 and 3. He does not focus on the tragedy in his life. He focuses on the amazing grace that God has shown him through Jesus Christ. Let us sing all three verses. You may remain seated as we do so. My sin, oh the joy of that glorious, of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, 
is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Can I get an amen? amen? Yes, yes. Would you pray with me? Oh God, as your word reminds us, you are a living and a loving God, and you alone endure forever. Your kingdom will not be destroyed, and your dominion will never end. You rescue and you save. You perform signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. God, you are God. And God, even in the midst of grief, in the midst of unexpected loss, God, you still are God. We do lift up Kathy Wing and their family in prayer at this time. We pray for your comfort, for your peace, for all those who knew and loved Michael, and those who perhaps only saw him from afar but were blessed by his gifts, and the talents that you gave him. We thank you for, for Michael. And God, in this week too, we have lost Billy Graham. Although, of course, he is uh, still alive with you and praising you as well. We thank you for his life. God, for the way you used him to draw so many people to you and to your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for Billy Graham. And God, in this week too, we uh, continue to read the news and to grieve at those who lost loved ones in the Parkland, um, Florida shooting. God, we pray for those students as they uh, prepare to march on Washington, asking for safer schools. And God, we pray for wisdom for our leaders at the national and state levels, for your wisdom, for your compassion, for your sense of justice. God, we pray, too, for the larger world. Um, as we see images of hospitals and apartments being shelled and bombed in Syria. God, as we hear of yet another uh, kidnapping of 100 students from a girls' school in Nigeria. God, the evil that is present in our world and that is even within our own hearts. God, your power, though, is greater. You are at work that even though the wrongs seem off so strong, God, you are the ruler yet. God, continue to show us how in our own lives, with our families, our loved ones, those closest to us, those who we live near or eat meals with, those who we work with or volunteer with. Show us, God, how you can use us, how you desire to use us as agents of change as an ambassador, ambassadors for Jesus Christ. God, when we desire to use our power to speak our mind, to uh, convince someone else that we are right, may we see the example of Jesus Christ who gave up his power, who set his glory aside, to become powerless for us. Help us, God, by your Holy Spirit, by your grace, to show love, to forgive where forgiveness is needed, 
to show your grace, to be agents of peace. God, show each of us how you want to use us, just even in one small way, to be agents of grace in your kingdom. God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, you claim us as your children, as sons and daughters. And so as your children, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, come and meet with us here and now, and reveal yourself to us, Lord, that we might see your nature, your character, and your will for us, and then, Lord, shape us to be like you, and to be obedient to that will. This we pray, amen. Death continues to be a problem for the human race. I don't just mean the unexpected loss of our beloved choir director, Michael, who we will miss. I was up here singing my hymns and thinking I'm not doing a duet anymore. <laughs> he used to be right there, or his voice in the back of my head as we do the prayer of confession. Those losses are unexpected and hard to deal with. But you know, I was thinking that we at Westminster, we deal with these losses all of the time. We rang something like 30 bells last uh, All Saints Day. We kind of walk around in a constant state of low-level grief here as part of this family. That's, that's a hard thing to do. Death continues to be an issue. And of course, the revered Billy Graham the whole of the Christian um, family is feeling that death. See, death is here, it's a reality, and we deal with it every week, but it's not just these kind of expected realizations that we're mortal. No, every time we turn on the news, every time we look at our world, we see that death hunts our land. You know, I have four totally different uh, images from four totally different parts of the world that were all from this week's news. When I preached over there several weeks ago, I had four completely different images from four completely different places in the world, and the reality is the same. We as a race continue to choose death. It's not just that death hunts us or chases after us. It seems like we as a race cannot help but hunt after it. War and rumors of war and threats of war and terrorist attacks and attempted terrorist attacks and riots and crackdowns and unrest, nations streaming to other nations. This is an ever-present reality when we look at our world. And it's not just limited to out there. We are so often reminded that it's right here among us. We impose death upon ourselves and upon one another. And that is for us every day something we have to realize. It kind of leaves us with a dilemma, though, as, as human beings. We either refuse to look at the world news or the national news or sometimes the local news, pretend that our world is pretty and nice and comfortable and safe, and go through life blissfully ignorant until suddenly it pops up in our face. Or else we can kind of go through life in a sense of overwhelmedness, 
feeling depressed and stressed because we human beings can't get our act together. Those aren't two very good options, are they? Well, Scripture offers us a third option. Look honestly at who we are as human beings. Look honestly at the human condition. And yes, do our best in our power to respond to it in a godly way. And also look closely at God's character and action and promises and choose hope. Choose courage in the face of the darkness. This is what the book of Isaiah is really about. Light in the darkness. Hope in the midst of chaos. Good news in bad places. Scripture is always very honest with who we are as human beings and very hopeful. Not because we'll somehow figure it out, but because we have a God who has a plan. And our God is faithful and true and all-powerful, and He is working that plan out even now. See, the whole Bible points to a single consistent story about what God is doing with these crazy creatures called people. And that means that even in the Old Testament, even these strange and un uncomfortable guys called the prophets, we should be able to see something of that story. In fact, regardless of our circumstances or the circumstances of humanity at every, any given moment, we can see that there is a constant message that God is transforming us. God is present. God is engaged. God will be triumphant no matter how complicated our lives become. So in the midst of the darkness that people have created for ourselves, God speaks through his prophet this promise that he will stick with us and work it out. So listen to God's word through the prophet Isaiah to us this morning. Isaiah chapter 2. Listen for the word of God. The word of the Lord, or the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is good news to be found for the human race in God's plan of salvation. I mean, the history of our race is one that is stained with constant murder and war. These are a few uh, archaeological finds, uh, both extremely old. These are some of the oldest human remains that have been found. One is from South America, the other is from Europe. One is a female, the other is a male. One is a nomadic hunter, they think. The other was a city dweller, they think. What do they have in common? Well, apparently they were both murder victims. Now, it's possible that archaeologists just watch too much CSI and have a tendency to jump to false conclusions when they find bones in a hole somewhere. Or it could point to something that seems to be a human tendency. We have a major in violence. As a race, we're really good at it, which is totally supported by the stories of Scripture. And what is the story the first story that follows Adam and Eve, right? Cain and Abel, the first children. 
The first human children is a, is a crime drama, the story. It's murder most foul, and the trajectory of humanity from then on throughout the whole Old Testament and throughout our human history hasn't changed much. I mean, don't get me wrong, humanity has a, a lot more going for it than this, right? We need to remember and we need to celebrate that too, otherwise everything becomes kind of dark. But when we, when we hear the statistics about the number of homicides or violent crimes in the United States, we also need to remember that there are something like 320 million people who didn't commit those crimes, right? That's good news. And we are, are a creative race. We build wonderful things. But my point is this, that there's something about us as a race, something within us that keeps us from being able to shake our propensity for violence. As we have advanced technologically, we haven't used that technology to break out of the habit of using power to try and dominate each other. And there have been great hopes for that through the years, that if we only learned this, then war will be no more, right? If we only have enough food, then we won't feel the need to hoard it anymore. Does that work? Never. We haven't kicked the habit yet nor likely are we uh, to do that on our own. Instead, we actually tend to use the technology that we develop to foster it. We use our technology to celebrate and practice violence. Just as a, an example, I, I don't think it's random that violence pervades our various entertainment. I'm not pointing fingers here. This is my world too. I had to face this as I was writing the sermon. See, I, I, I confess last week, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I do play games. I like to play computer games. I'm the first generation that grew up with computer games. And as I look back, even back to the 80s when I started playing computer games, the vast majority of them are about battling and war somehow. I don't know how many times I've conquered the world or, or another world or another galaxy, right? This is just what we do. The, the computer game industry is a $100 billion industry, and it's all about practicing violence. Now, before we start to knock on gamers, you need to know that it's not just video games, that seven out of the 10 of the highest grossing movies of all time have been about violence or war or had that at the center of their stories. I suppose we could all just switch over to sports instead and watch what, football? <laughs> Maybe we could do politics? <laughs> See, it's not like humanity has recently stumbled into this fascination either. One of my majors in college was theater. Y'all ever read any of those ancient dramas? <laughs> It's blood, blood, blood from the Greeks to the Romans to Shakespeare to modern TV. Blood, blood, blood. We idolize, we rehearse, we celebrate conflict and violence. We simply have a tendency to want to fight. I think in a world where we feel like we have no control, fighting is a natural way to feel like we're in control. If I can dominate you, then maybe I can feel better about me. Only it doesn't work. See, even when we feel like we're powerful, we don't feel like we're enough. And it just snowballs. See, dominating other people doesn't lead to peace, but the opposite. It stokes the urge to dominate again and to nominate more people. Even if we gain something now, we're just afraid of losing it, and so we have to, to tighten our grip. See, there's an inherent drive to want to use power to, to impose our will on others. And most of us show some sort of restraint when it comes to physically harming another, but that doesn't necessarily keep us from fighting to try to dominate each other in other ways. Maybe with our words, maybe with our money, to show that somehow we're on the top. And the thing is, our reasons for fighting are not always bad reasons. Sometimes they're even really necessary. I'm going to be honest. I am glad that people fought against the Nazis and their inhuman death camps. Evil must be imposed, uh, opposed. Sometimes the, need, the strong need to fight for the weak, sometimes it gets complicated. 
And sometimes we are fighting for safety, and sometimes we, people fight for supremacy. Sometimes people fight out of greed. Sometimes they fight from fear. Sometimes it's simple hatred. We don't know why people fight. Sometimes it's all mixed up. But the end result is that everyone is hurt. See, even using violence to suppress violence hurts the hero as well as the villain. I mean, I'm thankful for those who have fought to keep our world a better place, and yet they came back injured, even if they won. Can you imagine a humanity that doesn't raise its hand against each other? God can. For thousands of years, the sword was the epitome of human ingenuity and skill turned towards violence. It was leverage. Right? You put a little bit of metal in your hand and suddenly you have power, you have control. Even in our modern era, if somebody walked through our doors with one of those, they immediately have power over us, right? This is leverage. And this was a big part of Israel's problem for a long time. You might remember the story of David and Goliath. People tend to focus on the fact that David was puny and small and Goliath was a giant, but the biblical story actually tells us that one of the scariest things about Goliath was that he had a sword. More than that, he had an iron sword. See, that story starts with an arms race that Israel was losing badly. The Philistines had a monopoly on iron smithing, and therefore, they had iron swords and Israel didn't. In all of the armies of Israel, there were only two swords. King Saul had one, his son Jonathan had the other, and they were probably made out of bronze. And then you had the Philistines with Goliath with his iron sword, and this terrified them. And then little David comes along and says, you know, you may have the sword and the spear and the javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord. He said, it's not about that thing. And he took Goliath down. And he showed that it wasn't about technology or leverage, but about trusting in God. David took that piece of metal then from Goliath's hand and he used it to drive off the enemies of Israel. And when he was done, he didn't hang it over his mantelpiece as an heirloom in his house, although it was incredibly valuable. And he didn't wear it around to show his dominance to the rest of the people of Israel. No, he gave the technology back to God. He gave it to the priests. And Goliath's sword was displayed with the holy things in the tabernacle, a constant reminder that God is our hope, not iron, not power. But hundreds of years later, God's people had forgotten that. And once again, they had put all of their faith in military might. King Uzziah, Isaiah's king, had invested heavily in chariots and horses, in swords and shields and defense towers. He had modernized Israel's army. But they would all fall in the end. And God's people would be overwhelmed by those who had bigger armies and better arms. See, that's the inherent problem with violence. Dominance only lasts as long as you can keep it, as long as you can hold it in your hands. Anyone ever play King of the Hill when you were little? You see, I, I asked this over in the other side and nobody knew what I was talking about. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, try to, to share that I, I grew up in a rural setting and, you know, I, I'm glad my kids aren't here because they'd be like, oh, rolling their eyes again. When I was a kid, we played with dirt and we liked it. Right? We didn't have these fancy games. We just had a pile of dirt, and that was enough for us. You, the, the idea of King of the Hill is one person is the king on the top, and everybody else clambers up the side of the hill to try to knock them down. Right? You remember this game? We played it on piles of dirt and piles of gravel and piles of snow, and once we played it on a slag pile. Um, that one didn't end very well. Um, but the reality is, no matter what kind of pile you have, the concept's the same. You try to stay on top, and you can, briefly. But you know, as soon as you get on top, what's happening? Somebody's behind you trying to take you out. And when you turn there, somebody else from behind you is taking you out. And this is exactly what happened with Israel. World history bears this out. Not just with Israel, with every nation in the world. Look at history. Just read history. This has happened time and time again on a national scale. 
an endless cycle of vengeance and violence. Can you even imagine a humanity without violence where all of the money and all of the time and all of the energy and all of the intelligence that we have is poured into, into instead of domin, uh, dominion and uh, dominance, is instead poured into creating life and beauty. Can you imagine that humanity? God can. But right now, our human nature is killing us. Jesus reminds people of that as he's being arrested. Peter is ready to fight and die for the sake of Jesus' new revolution. Let's take peace to the world using the sword. And Jesus stops him. He said, this is not my way, Peter. You can read it in Matthew 26, 52. This is not my way. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. This isn't a divine judgment. Jesus is just telling things as they are. Humanity has a way of doing things, and it's not my way. I have a better way, he says. See, God has a deep unhappiness with the human condition. This is what he's communicating with people through the prophet Isaiah. The first five chapters are about God's deep trouble with his people. People are doing violence to each other, and it's not all the, the, the obvious violence of the sword. They're also using their power and their economics and other ways to oppress one another. He says this is a sickness. It is a cancer at the heart of their society, and it's killing them. And God pronounces one of the worst judgments he can give. He says, I'm about to step back and let you have your way. Romans 1, Paul says that this is, this is what God does in his anger, that in his anger he gave them over to their sin. They let them have their way. And Israel would feel the full weight of their own way as the nations trampled over the top of them. And yet, in the midst of that declaration of judgment, he also gives us a vision. He gives us this vision of hope. Someday, he says, someday this part of you, this tendency to take iron into your hand and crush the people around you is going to be excised. It will be no more. All the nations will learn from me. They will learn my way. I will take care of things. I will show you how to live. I will judge between the nations and you will make war no longer. You will give up violence and I will show you a better way. Someday I will take the very thing that is killing you, that sword in your hands, and it will be turned into something that brings life instead, that plows the field and, and gives the opportunity for growth. You will take up this iron in your hands and use it not to kill, but to bring life. Can you vision a human race without war or violence? God can. More than that, God has a plan. And John Lennon's imagine is not it. Right? You remember that song? He says, no hell below us, above us, only sky. He wants to excise God from the plan. So many people, so many humans have said in the past, we can do this if we try on our own. That's why the United Nations was founded, right? This idea that if we all get together, we can make it happen. That's where this sculpture, by the way, is found in front of the United Nations building in New York. Right? We seized upon this image and said, let's do this thing together. How's it worked? See, we haven't. Human nature is inherently divisive and dominating. And there's an irony to this picture. You can see the little chain link fence along the bottom. It's extra security because they were worried that the week that this picture was taken, they were worried about an attack on the UN. We can't do it. No matter how great we think, we need help. There's only one who can change human nature, and that is God's plan. That was the plan. See, God himself would turn the world upside down and break the cycle of violence and dominance by entering into it, not as the one who would crush his opponents, but as the one who was crushed by his opponents. 
He entered into it in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. And instead of using His power to dominate us like we tend to do, He submitted to our power. He laid down before our brokenness and evil. He humbled Himself. He opened Himself up. And He took it in. He gave Himself into our hands and look what we did. See, Jesus taught radical things like humility, like not returning evil for evil, like not fighting back, but choosing to die instead of maintaining the cycle of evil, choosing to love instead, choosing to pour one's life in the power of love to overcome. He said, love even your enemies. Those are hard words. But he proved that power himself personally. See, Jesus took iron into his hands, only not the way we do it. Not to smite or destroy, he let it pierce him. He gave up his life and he returned no evil for the evil we gave. And he turned that death into triumph because he believed in his Father and the power of love to bring life out of death. How does that picture compare with the attitude of our world or even with our attitude? See, most people, even Christians, consider this as sort of ridiculous. I mean, it's great that Jesus did it, but I don't have to, right? It's okay if I fight back. I know it's complicated, but I want you to hold on to that discomfort for a moment. See, this is exactly what Jesus did to find our freedom for us. And that's exactly where we find our freedom. God speaks to people lost in a darkening world and he says to us, there is real power in my way. There is healing in humility and grace and peace. I'm not just talking about the stage of world politics here. I mean, you and your relationships. There is healing in humility. What would it look like if you this week swallowed your pride and sought peace with the people around you? Not sought to be right, not sought to win the argument. I mean, no matter what it takes, sought peace. Picked up your cross and sought forgiveness and reconciliation. What if we, all of us, traded our swords for nails? God says there's power in this. And he invites us to it. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. And yet it transformed the world. It has transformed the world time and time again. We just forget. God has a better way. How might you seek that way this week? Let us pray. Lord God, I confess it's not easy. I want dominance in my life. Teach me to trust you enough. Teach us, Lord, to trust you enough to let go, to seek you and your life in your character and in emulating that character. And give us the courage, Lord, to stand even against terrifying things in this world and put our trust in you instead. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. We see that God has given everything in his son, Jesus Christ, for our sakes. Let us give ourselves back to him. As a symbol of that, let's bring our tithe and offering, remembering that that's just a part of what we lay down at his feet. dwell in me so 
you may dwell in me. The work was done with nothing but
Father, we offer these gifts to you. Take them and use them to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout our valley and around this world. And God, use us. Use us as we give up our power, as we lay aside our need to be right in order to show your love and show your grace and to draw people to you. We praise this in Jesus' name and let all God's people say, Amen. Let us continue standing for our final hymn, number 77, Be Still My Soul. We'll sing all verses. <laughs> and most difficult and most terrifying words of Jesus were, love your enemy. It is not easy. In fact, the only way it is possible is if we actually believe what we just sang, that God truly is sovereign and that no matter what happens to us, he is going to make sure that everything is okay in the end. This is what drove the early church. It is what gave them the power to remake our world and we can do it again. Know that God is sovereign and put your trust fully in him. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen.